Good morning. Uh, this is a hearing on Obamacare's employer penalty and its impact on temporary workers. Uh, the committee will uh, come to order. I will recognize myself for an opening statement and then the uh, distinguished gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Two months ago, this committee heard from five business owners that the new health care law will cause them to reinvest less in their companies, reduce the number of workers on their payrolls, automate more services, and move workers into part-time status to minimize compliance costs. The testimony revealed that job loss from the law might be considerably worse than the CBO predicted, which was 800,000 jobs lost by the end of the decade. Today, we will hear from professionals in the staffing and temporary worker industry that will highlight the negative impact of Obamacare on their industry and the economy as a whole. This hearing will provide a better understanding of the vital role that staffing firms and temporary workers play in our economy and will also reveal the negative effects of burdensome statutes in President Obama's health care law. American staffing companies are an extremely important component of our economy. As a sector, they employ near, nearly 3 million workers per day and over 10 million workers annually. For many workers and businesses, staffing firms provide an on-the-job interview that often leads to permanent employment. Even workers who do not gain permanent employment from their position earn a paycheck and improve upon a skill set. Perhaps most importantly, staffing firms promote flexibility in the labor market, which is an essential feature of job creation. In fact, between June 2009 and June 2011, the staffing industry added nearly half a million jobs, accounting for over 90 percent of all total non-farm job growth. Unfortunately, this industry is threatened. The new health care law is bad for temporary workers, and it will harm America's ability to have a more flexible labor force to better compete in the global economy. The President's health care law, Obamacare, contains many reasons for this pessimism. The employer mandate provision places a tax penalty on businesses that fail to offer their full-time workers a health insurance package, with terms dictated by the Department of Health and Human Services. This employer mandate places the burden of carrying out the President's vision of health care reform on the backs of businesses. The law defines a full-time worker as an employee who works at least three, uh, 30 hours per week with respect to any month. Because of the high administrative cost of doing calculations for each worker each month, the Department of Treasury does not think this provision is workable and is proposing a look-back period of 3 to 12 months for the purposes of calculating the employer mandate tax penalty. The law's non-discrimination rules prohibit an employer from providing different health insurance to different classes of workers. The penalty for violating this non-discrimination rule is $100 per day per affected employee. The administration is currently writing this regulation and is seemingly oblivious that it is common sense to compensate different classes of workers differently. However, there is a common sense economic principle that everyone can understand. As something gets more expensive, people tend to buy less of it. With the employer mandate tax penalty, the minimum essential benefit package, and the non-discrimination rules, this health care law has made the cost of labor more expensive. These provisions will result in fewer jobs and lower wages for many Americans. Unfortunately, those most affected will be younger workers and those with fewer skills. Many of these workers are just now starting their career paths, and because of this irrational law, they will have more difficulty getting their feet in the door, which will delay or prevent them from learning the skills that are necessary to move up the economic ladder. In reality, for many Americans, the American dream will be replaced by government dependency. The witnesses before us today may testify about the urgent need to exempt temporary workers from the employer mandate and non-discrimination rules. They may also call for a longer look-back period. In essence, there will be more calls for Obamacare waivers. A government by waiver environment, as Richard Epstein calls it, creates uncertainty and breeds favoritism. Uncertainty translates into economic stagnation and only promulgates the distrust in our Federal Government. Rather than issuing waivers to particular industries, the health care law should be repealed and common sense reforms that lower health care costs should be pursued. This is the only way to combat the negative effects of the Affordable Care Act that are currently rippling across our economy. That I would recognize the distinguished gentleman from Illinois, the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, 
I want to begin by thanking the witnesses for their appearance today. I appreciate the fact that you traveled quite a distance to share your concerns about the Affordable Care Act, and for that we are grateful. We want to listen, we want to, listen to you. Our discussions with the American people led to the Affordable Care Act. We learned that there is nothing more important and precious than good health. This should not be a privilege afforded to just a few. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act provided a pathway to accessible health care for the masses. In an effort to balance the needs of businesses and workers, we understand that the administration is listening, too, and it has opened the process for crafting the implementation of ACA. Innumerable hours have been spent communicating with stakeholders, employers, and employees. Several government agencies, including the Internal Revenue Service, have solicited public comment on a range of employment issues. This has been and continues to be a fair, transparent, and flexible process. The ACA was clearly designed with a temporary worker in mind. Because in America, most people have obtained health insurance through their employer, and temporary workers have been at a disadvantage. For many, temporary work has meant working for minimum wage or slightly higher by the hour with generally no access to health care. These are among the workers receiving primary care in the emergency room. These are among the workers that are forced into bankruptcy due to a tragic accident. The ACA has provided a solution to that problem for temporary workers. The ACA is immeasurable progress, but no one here believes that it is perfection. And that is why the public input is crucial in this process of developing implementing regulations for this law. But let us not lose sight of the major achievement for temporary workers that the ACA represents. We look forward to your testimony. Again, I thank you for your appearance and yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman from Illinois. Uh, it is my pleasure now to introduce our witnesses. I would ask you uh, to come up um, at this time. On behalf of all of us, we are delighted to have you and appreciate your willingness to uh, lend us your expertise. I will introduce you uh, from my left to right, your right to left, and after the introductions are complete, uh, you will be recognized for your five-minute opening statement. There may be a series or panel of lights in front of you, and those uh, lights mean what they traditionally mean in society. Uh, green is go. Yellow is speed up and see if you can get through the stop light quickly, and red means see if you can uh, wind up your thought. Uh, and uh, just by way of reminder, uh, make sure you turn on your microphone so we can uh, hear you loud and clear. Uh, Mr. Ed uh, Lenz, did I pronounce your name correctly? Is Senior Vice President of the American Staffing Association. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Lenz. John Uprichard is the President and CEO of Fine Great People International and a resident of the upstate of South Carolina, um, I hasten to add. Mr. Uh, Tab uh, Gauss, Goss? Okay. Apologize for that. President CEO of the Action Group Human Services Solution. And Mr. Christopher Spiro is Managing Director for Health Policy at the Center for American Progress Action Fund. Uh, welcome to each of you, and we would now recognize Mr. Lenz for his opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we greatly appreciate the opportunity to testify this morning. Uh, I appreciate uh, your excellent overview of the issue that confronts the staffing industry, and I do appreciate uh, Mr. Davis's comments as well. Uh, and uh, thank you to the other members of the subcommittee as, uh, as well. 
Um, I am Senior Vice President for Legal and Public Affairs of the Association, which represents staffing firms throughout the United States. Uh, I'm try, I'll try not to repeat uh, all of the points that uh, the Chairman made, but uh, I think I'll try to touch the highlights. Staffing firms play a vital role in the economy. As you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, we provide critical employment flexibility for employees and businesses, and we provide uh, services in every sector of the economy in a wide range of jobs. Uh, uh, Mr. Davis noted the, the low-income uh, workers, but I think it is also important to point out that staffing firms today provide uh, services in the health care, information technology, engineering, scientific sectors, including professional and managerial services. So uh, the low-income workers are certainly a part of our workforce, but by no means uh, necessarily representative of it. Uh, we are also playing a vital role in the current economy by keeping people working. Uh, without the temporary work option, uh, U.S. unemployment rates would be much higher. Uh, you noted, Mr. Chairman, that about uh, almost 3 million people work on any given day, but uh, over the course of a year, 10 million go through our doors, uh, showing the high turnover of the temporary uh, workforce. The reason for that primarily is that most people use temporary work as a short-term stopgap on their way to permanent employment, and we facilitate that. And one of the things we are most concerned about, the impact of this law, is it would put a dampening effect on our ability to bridge people into permanent work. Uh, and, of course, we are concerned about the impact of the employer tax penalties. Uh, as you mentioned, they are assessed in uh, one of two ways. If you do offer coverage to your workers, uh, you only pay a tax on those people getting subsidies. If you don't offer coverage, you pay the tax on all of your full-time employees. The staffing firms are uniquely exposed to the penalties for two reasons. The one is the unpredictable nature of temporary work, which means that staffing firms have no way of knowing who will be a full-time employee and therefore won't have any way of knowing what their penalties will be or who to enroll in coverage. The second is that they have limited health insurance options uh, for covering their temporary workers, which means they might not have a practical way to offer coverage to everybody, which means they pay penalties on all their full-time employees, not just those getting subsidies. So it is a conundrum. Uh, the historical reasons for why there is limited coverage for temporary employees is simple. It stems from the fact that they are short-term, uh, high-turnover workers, and when given the option of health coverage, they generally refuse it. Only a tiny fraction of temporary employees accept coverage from their employer, even when it is available. So it is hard to get insurance companies to write that kind of coverage. The result has been that the low-cost so-called mini-med plans have been the only practical option for most staffing firms. If they are abolished, staffing firms may not have an economical way to offer coverage, uh, especially if the new non-discrimination rules limit their ability to provide flexible coverage for workers as they need it and to the extent that they need it. So to address these issues, we need two things to happen. Uh, and, and I should say, in, in parent, uh, parenthetically and, and without uh, minimizing the point, uh, we are strongly in favor of, of health care insurance for people uh, and for reform in general. We think uh, all, many of the aspects of this bill are, are sound and to be applauded, but the, as structured, it creates enormous problems for employers uh, that need to be addressed, and we're, we're hoping that they can be. First, we need a sensible definition of who is a full-time employee. And you mentioned the look-back rule the Treasury is currently considering. We strongly support that. Uh, the second, uh, and, it, and it ought to be a, a look-back of at least uh, 12 months, we believe. Uh, second, we need to have viable health insurance options for temporary employees, which means that the non-discrimination rules have to be uh, drafted so as to permit that. Now, we are working with the administration, as I mentioned, to do that, but our concern is that the statute may not afford enough leeway for them to do what they need to do to fix the problem. And so our preference would be for the employer penalties to be repealed entirely or substantially reduced or modified. Staffing firms operate on razor-thin margins, and they can't afford to put those costs through to employers. If they do, as you pointed out, uh, the result will be fewer temporary jobs. So the elimination of the penalties would resolve that problem, and we hope that Congress would consider doing that. 
We appreciate the opportunity to testify. We look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Mr. Upridge. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today and discuss the impact of health care reform on the staffing industry and my company specifically. My name is John U. Pritchard, and I am the President and CEO of Find Great People. We are a temporary staffing and executive search firm headquartered in Greenville, South Carolina, with offices throughout the Carolinas. We have actually been in business for 30 years and have provided job opportunities and stabilities to thousands of people throughout the Carolinas as well as nationwide. We work very hard to take good care of our employees, and as a result, we have been recognized as best place to work in South Carolina for three years in a row. In order to help clarify the ramifications of health care reform on my organization, I would like to give you some background on my company. We currently have 50 internal employees with an average salary of $64,000 a year and an average tenure of five years. Our internal payroll for 2010 was $2.9 million, and our temporary payroll was $7.4 million. We provide 100 percent of our internal employees health insurance and long-term disability insurance premiums. We also give them access to our 401 k retirement savings plan. In addition, they have a very generous time off as well. We believe that our internal employees are vital to the success of our organization, and we are very committed to their individual financial success and stability. Moving to the folks who work with us on a temporary basis, we also recognize the need to provide fair competitive wages and benefits to them. We currently have 400 people working for us on a temporary basis at one time. The average wage is $14.28, well above the, the national minimum wage. We provide these temporary employees with access to a mini-med coverage that is not dependent on their temporary work schedule because we know that their hours will fluctuate and we want them to have consistent access to medical care. In addition, they have access to our 401 k program. The average assignment length from one of our temporary employees is five months. And in most cases, the temporary assignments serve as a bridge to a full-time job opportunity either with one of our clients or a different employer of their choice. Those full-time job opportunities are usually dependent upon their performance with the opportunity they are given at one of our customers. As we began to study the impact of health care reform on our business, we quickly recognized that there were some very significant and unintended consequences. First is cost. Based upon historical volumes, our monthly health care costs would increase by $62,000 to $76,000 per month. That is a mathematical problem for us. In addition, the administrative cost to comply with the regulatory and compliance aspects would be over $40,000 annually. Offering coverage to temporary employees will be difficult because their hours fluctuate and they are moving in and out of coverage constantly. Also, it is essential to note that we do not control the hours. Those are controlled by the clients that we provide the service to. Ultimately, health care reform legislation imposes large employer costs and in infrastructure on staffing firms like FGP because we cannot qualify as a small business. We technically have 400 employees, but only 50 are regular full-time staff. You might ask, why can't we pass on this cost to our customers? This is a question that we have studied the feasibility of, and we do not believe it is a viable solution based upon our recent experience with increased costs from our state unemployment taxes. In 2011, in the State of South Carolina, we had a 300 percent increase in our state unemployment taxes. We had to go have those conversations with our customers, and we received significant pushback. Our volume started to drop as a result of those conversations. Once we take into account the increased costs from health care reform and unemployment taxes, we really hit a ceiling on price, where the client actually looks at the cost-benefit analysis and says it doesn't make sense and it's an affordability issue. As a result, jobs are going to be impacted, and unfortunately, those jobs will be impacted within our own organization for the full-time and temporary folks that work with us. And this could result in hundreds of jobs per year. That's what keeps me up at night. That's difficult. The people that have helped us build this company, especially the 50 employees that are with us internally, they have been with us for several years. And if we are unable to move forward, we have to make a business decision. And we will, we will not close as a company, but we will more than likely get out of the temporary staffing business, which means we will have to downsize those employees that have worked with us for many years. 
I appreciate the opportunity to come before the committee today. I would ask that the committee strongly um, you know, support the, the look back rule that the Treasury Department is now considering. Thank you, Mr. Uh, you uh, Mr. Gauss. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the committee, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me here today. I'm Tav Gauss. I'm from Eastern North Carolina. I started my business 30 years ago um, after going to University of North Carolina, the real Carolina, and then Wake Forest University, and then being a commercial banker. Um, so as to not repeat what you've already heard, it's in my testimony, but let me get down to some brass tacks. Uh, I have 16 permanent people in my company whose payroll is over a million dollars a year. We're in eastern North Carolina. Uh, I think two of my folks have a college degree. The rest are high school degree or associates. And the average tenure with my company during the 30 years is 18 years. These people are benefited with health insurance for which they pay a premium. Uh, significantly large premium. We have a huge deductible. Um, we have a 401k plan that is open to our permanent staff as well as our field staff. The field staff, to my knowledge, there have been fewer than 50 people who have wanted to contribute to that in the 30 years we have been in business. We match the 5 percent match or whatever, and we do that for field staff as well. We have a lot of vacation time for our permanent staff, and we have paid vacation for our temporary staff who have been with us over 1,500 hours, and it continues on for as long as they live with us at certain levels. We have 1,700 field staff uh, this year. Um, Many med plans have been offered to them since 1992. I can't tell you the numbers that have come across our desk and, and the ones that would work and wouldn't work, et cetera, et cetera. And to my knowledge, we have never had a temporary staffer take their portion of the mini med plan. And I can say that with 99 percent positive, uh, positive thought. They would rather have the money. My people make an average, my temporary staff makes an average of $9.25 an hour, which is significantly above the prevailing minimum wage in North Carolina and the Federal Government. Um, we live in a, I wouldn't say rural part of the State, but we're not in a metropolitan part of the State. And if you take $9.25 an hour, that annualizes at a little less than $20,000 a year. They would much rather have that extra $40, $30 a week or whatever than to pay for medical care, some of which they are young and they are bulletproof and they think they don't need it, and some would rather have the money. If the health care plan goes in as it is written now, my premiums for health insurance will go from $80,000 a year to $711,000 a year. I would close my doors. All of my people would be out of work, temporary and permanent staff. If I was able to pass some of that cost on to my temporary staff, say 20 percent, I'm still out of business because it goes from 80,000 to 500,000. In an effort to skip ahead, if I may say this, um, I know this bill was passed with good intentions by everybody who signed off on it. There is no doubt in my mind we need reform in health care. When you just look at my personal situation with the $5,000 and $10,000 deductible, that is pretty high. But when you take the health care plan and you put it on top of the increases in Federal unemployment taxes, State unemployment taxes, regulatory, uh, more and more um, rules and laws and fees being being uh, charged and fines being raised and charged. This is a piling on. I ask that if you will please just put it off for a while until we get the loose ends tied up. We cannot figure out how to stay in business the way this plan is written now. And by the way, the Treasury's idea on look back is not a bad idea, but 
it needs to be 12 months. Three months is way too short a period of time for a lot of obvious reasons that I won't go into here. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Gals. Mr. Spiro. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Davis, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Starting in 2014, all Americans will have access to affordable health insurance. Carl Camden, President and CEO of Kelly Services, one of the largest employers of temporary workers, explains why this is so important. Quote, the United States remains the only advanced nation in which individuals lack access to affordable group health coverage outside the employment setting. As a result, health insurance-related job lock afflicts millions, which is bad for entrepreneurship, worse for economic dynamism, and frustrating for an industry that relies on a free agent workforce. Simply put, nontraditional workers are treated badly by the current model. Any policy choice that enhances the availability and mobility of talent is a good thing for the staffing industry and the economy as a whole. As Mr. Camden observes, access to affordable health insurance will benefit not only workers, but also their employers. Preventive care will reduce absenteeism and increase the productivity of workers. Health care costs for the uninsured will no longer be shifted onto employers through higher premiums. And for staffing firms, millions of newly insured Americans will create demand for health care workers of all types. In addition to these economic benefits, many temporary workers who work long, hard hours but may be struggling to pay the bills and cannot afford health insurance through no fault of their own will not lay awake at night out of a fear that a family member will become sick, sending the family over the edge into bankruptcy. If you agree with Mr. Camden that access to affordable health insurance is a good thing, as I do, then employer responsibility is an essential piece of the puzzle. It provides an incentive for employers that currently offer coverage to maintain that coverage. Otherwise, many employers might drop coverage and allow taxpayers to pick up the tab, which would increase the Federal deficit by billions of dollars. In fact, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office concluded that the absence of employer responsibility would significantly erode employer-based coverage. Simple financial comparisons of potential penalty liabilities to the cost of coverage may not drive employer decisions. Many employers offer coverage because their employees expect them to do so, and they want to remain competitive in the labor market. Since individuals will have a responsibility to maintain coverage, there will be much more demand for their employers to offer it. And finally, the cost of coverage will still be excluded from income and payroll taxes. In fact, in Massachusetts, enrollment in employer-based coverage actually increased even during the recession. Therefore, it is not surprising CBO concluded that the Affordable Care Act would have very little effect on employer-based coverage. Congress carefully targeted employer responsibility under, under the Affordable Care Act, and the Treasury Department is carefully examining how to implement the law so that it is practical and flexible for employers. I want to highlight several aspects of the statute and its implementation that demonstrate this careful approach. First, and most importantly, employer responsibility only applies to large employers with at least 50 full-time employees. As a result, the vast majority of employers will be exempt from employer responsibility altogether. Second, small employers do not become large employers just because they hire seasonal workers. Third, since penalties apply with respect to full-time employees, the definition of full-time employee is important. Treasury has proposed a safe harbor in which an employer can generally look back up to 12 months to determine whether employees average at least 30 hours per week. Employers for Flexibility in Health Care, a coalition of employers that rely on large numbers of temporary workers, strongly supports Treasury's propo pro proposal, commenting that it, quote, has the potential to provide flexibility employers need to preserve flexible work arrangements, provide a stable source of coverage, and allow for the practical administration of benefits, unquote. In addition to proposing the safe harbor, Treasury has requested comments on alternative methods. Of course, any method must not undermine the purpose of employer responsibility that I discussed earlier, to prevent erosion of employer-based coverage, which would be disruptive and increase costs to taxpayers. In closing, 
Employers of temporary workers need not fear employer responsibility. It is an essential part of health reform, which will expand access to affordable health insurance to millions of Americans. Mr. Camden of Kelly Services writes, quote, Some have suggested that higher penalties imposed on staffing firms will narrow the cost advantage of using temporary employees and thus weaken demand for our services. I think that concern is misplaced, unquote. Rather, Mr. Camden sees significant opportunity that the Affordable Care Act will, quote, accelerate the growth of nontraditional workers and remove longstanding barriers to employment options, unquote. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my testimony, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Spiro. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn before they testify, so I would ask you to please uh, stand and raise your right hands. You solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. I do. May the uh, record reflect all witnesses answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. I would also warn, not warn, that is not the right word, um, all of us are subject to being called for votes uh, at any minute. So what we would do in that case is go as quickly as we can to vote and then come back as quickly as we can so we can all be good stewards of your time. But uh, we do not control um, the floor and the timing of votes. Uh, Mr. Spiro, are you familiar with the phrase Pyrrhic victory? I am. And what is a Pyrrhic victory? It is a victory that at first uh, is small but turns out to be uh, not a victory. Right. It is when uh, you win the battle but all your soldiers die. Correct. Um, the gentleman to the right of you just testified that they are going to lay off workers if this is not changed. And yet you, and I would assume you would agree with me, they have better access to information with respect to their businesses than you do. You agree with that? I agree that he probably has more access to information about his workers than I do. Right. That is not a trick question. They have better access to the uh, numbers within their own business than you would have. And they both testify that they are going to lay off workers if this isn't changed. So I guess my question, and it may be a rhetorical question, are you better to have access to full health care and no job? Or are you better to have a job and a mini med plan? Mr. Chairman, um, they are still uh, implementing the law. Treasury is still carefully implementing the law. So Mr. Gauss which, which raises another does not point. have full information about how the law will be implemented. Which raises another point. Did you testify before any committee or subcommittee when they were um, debating or considering the Affordable Care Act? No, I did not. Do you know anyone who did? Yes. You do? How many committee hearings did they have? There were several committee hearings over a span of many years leading up to the passage of the Affordable Care Act. And amendments were um, able to be offered? I can't speak to that. Do you know if any representatives from the, from the businesses to your right were able to give their perspective on it? I would have to go back. I am happy to go back and search through the hearing record. But What do you think the Speaker meant when she said we will have to pass it to see what is in it? I think she meant perhaps that the benefits of the Affordable Care Act only will be realized in 2014. It will take some time for the general public to become comfortable with this law. But I think I agree with the Speaker that once people have experience under the law, as they have had in Massachusetts, the public overwhelmingly supports that law. Um, Mr. Eup Richard, you. Um you have such a good reputation in the upstate of South Carolina personally, and your business does it as well. And the thing that I was struck by when you and I met and talked is there wasn't a partisan comment that came out of your mouth. There wasn't an ideological comment that came out of your mouth. There wasn't a political comment that came out of your mouth. I, to this day, do not know your politics. And frankly, it is none of my business. The entire extent of our conversation was your concern for whether or not you were going to have to lay off your workers because of this. So I would like you to tell me, take a minute, take a minute and a half, tell me 
This has nothing to do with politics from your perspective. This is all about saving your business and allowing you to provide jobs to people that you care deeply about. And you are genuinely fearful that if this is not changed, you are not going to be able to keep them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You are correct. That's, that is really what keeps me up at night. When we look at our staffing business, the margins are not significant. They are thin. And when we have significant increased costs that we can't pass on to our customers, it becomes a mathematical problem. We also take on significant risk with our staffing business. Personal guarantees that I personally guarantee millions of dollars of working capital for this staffing business to run. As a business owner, one of the things I have to do is do a cost, benefit, and risk analysis. And as the margins erode, the risk is too great, and it doesn't make sense to move forward. The challenge with that is we have built a great company, and I have 50 employees that have been with us for several years, people that I are, I'm friends with. I coach their kids in soccer. I see them all the time out in the community, and they earn high wages. The challenge will be is we will no longer be able to move forward with temporary staffing as part of the services that we offer, which means I will reduce my infrastructure, resulting in probably at least half of our employees losing their jobs. And with the impact on our industry, it, they really aren't able to go get jobs with other staffing companies because they will also be impacted as well. So that's what keeps me up at night, and that's what's important because that's what I'm responsible for is making sure that we provide a paycheck to those 50 employees as well as the temporary employees that we have out on billing on a weekly basis. Thank you, Mr. Uprichard. I uh, would now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And again, I want to thank the witnesses for being here. Mr. Lins, let me ask you, uh, what would you say are the basic reasons for temporary employment? It is a, uh, a broad question, and there are many answers. Uh, some of them are from the worker's standpoint, others from the business standpoint. Employees use temporary help most often as a stopgap when they are out of work, looking for new work, or simply looking for a different kind of opportunity. Students, uh, retired people uh, make up a huge portion of the workforce. In the current environment, lots of people are unemployed and the only work they can find is temporary work. The reason why temporary jobs have been uh, played and uh, constitute such a huge a portion of the new jobs that have been created since the recession technically ended in June of 2009 is precisely because of business uncertainty, uh, a concern about making a commitment to permanent hire, but they still need to get the job done. So the temporary employees are a way for them to get the job done and a way to keep uh, a substantial portion of the population employed. So uh, that is a unique situation in the current environment. But from the business standpoint, more generally, I think the key word is flexibility. Uh, most labor economists recognize that flexible labor markets is one reason why we have had in the past and hopefully will again soon in the future have such a dynamic economy because employers can make uh, employment decisions based on the, the needs of their businesses and the conditions in the economy and use labor as needed. Uh, I think it is also important to, to point out that uh, temporary jobs represent a relatively small percentage of non-farm jobs on a daily basis, really less than 2 percent. But we play a disproportionate role in the economy because we provide that flexibility to both employees and to, and to employers. Let me ask you, would a diminution of temporary work uh, foster an increase in full-time work? I don't think so. Perhaps uh, at the margin, some. But uh, there is such reluctance on the part of businesses to overhire and to burden themselves with, with 
uh, workers that they cannot sustain and cannot support because the business isn't there, that I don't think uh, that shortfall would be made up in permanent jobs by any means. Uh, Mr. Goss, can I, do you think seasonal work becomes a big factor in, in, in this as well? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, yes. Um, in seasonal work where I come from usually has to do with agriculture, and that's, there's, you don't find temporary employees as, you know, by definition in the agricultural seasonal work. But I've got friends who are in, like, Miami and New York, and the seasons, the hotel workers, the restaurant workers and everything, and then once the season's over, um, then they go someplace else and put them where else they are, wherever else they are needed. Uh, could I expand a little bit on your question? Yes. When I first started this years and years ago, um, basically when someone would call us is because somebody's going to be out on vacation. Um, as time has gone by, and most of my business is manufacturing, light industrial is what we call it in our industry. Industries, especially as they have uh, the global economy, have got to be more flexible. To answer your question, if we were, if our industries were only doing business in the United States of America, I don't know, there may be more permanent hiring. They're scared to death, but it's not, and we are competing against a lot of low-wage countries. And for our manufacturers to stay flexible, it protects the jobs of their permanent employees. If they have too many permanent employees on board, they have to lay off a ton of people where they lay off a temporary staff here, we can go put this temporary staff someplace else. Finally, quickly, do you think that under the Affordable Care Act, more small businesses will be able to provide some form of health care for their workers than without it. Small businesses defined as what? Pardon? Small businesses as defined how? Oh, individuals, uh, companies with 25 or less employees. I don't, it doesn't apply to me. So I don't, well, actually, I, I'm two businesses. I'm a, considered a large business, by the way, by statute. Because, but yet we have less than 50 permanent employees. Um, like I said, my premium right now is $80,000. My portion is $80,000 a year. My staff pays about $40,000 a year in, and we have 16 people, and there's a $5,000 deductible and a $10,000 family deductible. So your question is, I have no earthly idea. I would love to think mine would come down. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, may, may I just uh, respond to Mr. Davis uh, br very briefly on the small business aspect of this? Uh, I, I think it is an important question and a, and a good question, uh, but, but the, the problem is the definition of small business really doesn't, it rarely does a staffing firm very much good, and the reason for that is uh, most staffing firms have very small uh, permanent staffs and large numbers of temporary employees that come and go. And the, if, if you were to measure the size of the company by revenue, they might be small under Small Business Administration standards, but by headcount standards, they almost always exceed 25 and even 50. And with respect to the state health insurance exchanges, they, are, they have more than 100. You've got to be awfully, awfully small to meet those headcount uh, thresholds and the vast majority of staffing firms cannot meet them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman from Illinois. The Chair would now recognize the distinguished gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Gozar. Mr. Chairman, I would like to submit for the record uh, testimony from um, a ski area um, in Flagstaff, Arizona, which I would like to highlight with talking about temporary workers. Without objection. And this letter basically highlights what we do in the West when we have temporary solutions as far as um, utilizing a ski area that may operate as, as little as six weeks out of, a, out of a year, as many as four months out of the year. So um, that gives us a great idea. Um, Mr. Sparrow, have you ever run a business? No. So you never signed the back end of a paycheck? That's correct. How does, um, Mr. Gauss, how does uh, your administrative cost, you've been in business for 30 years, I've been, was in business for about 27 years, um, in healthcare, by the way, um, 
How much has your overhead gone up in the administrative uh, aspect in regards to rules and regulations? I would say a good 75 percent over the last eight or nine years. Hmm. Interesting. Mr. Spiro, do you think the government has the right to turn out the lights on a business? No, but I don't think they are turning out the light on business. So how would you answer these two gentlemen that if these rules go into effect and they are fairly nebulous rules, um, how would they stay in business? Congressman, I haven't seen all the numbers and assumptions that they have used. All I can tell you is that the CBO studied this issue comprehensively. They looked at all the studies out there and concluded that the effects of the Affordable Care Act on labor markets would be purely marginal. It actually shows, let's go back and recalibrate that, it actually shows that we lose a significant amount of jobs and cost incredibly more than was originally um, orchestrated. Was that not true? I disagree with your conclusion. And that's not what the CBO said? They said Let me ask you a question, marginal sir. effects. Let me ask you a question, sir. Uh, you are familiar with the Massachusetts model? I am somewhat familiar, but I am not from Massachusetts. Well, but you cited it, did you not? That is correct. I did cite it in my Has testimony. Has premiums gone up? They have gone up as, as they have gone up everywhere around the country. Uh, the so it is not a solution. In Massachusetts so it is not, not a solution. It was never intended to uh, lower costs. They are now engaging in a second round of reforms, payment reforms, intended to lower costs. So what you are saying to me is you are promoting, you, get, you actually highlighted it for me that it was a solution process, but it is not a solution process because we have seen these premiums going up all over the place. It was a solution to the problem of the uninsured. And on that score, Massachusetts has been found to be wildly successful and popular, reducing the uninsured rate to a couple of percent. And let me ask you the question, where did that money be dumped on? Was it on the backs of the businesses or on the taxpayer? It was let from, me answer it for you, on the taxpayer. It was from it, taking the cost of uncompensated care and redistributing it so that it wasn't being shifted onto higher premiums for employers. So let me ask you the next question. Premiums went up then or went down? So what's your analogy, what you just said, they should have gone down. They went up, sir. They will we need to have them. When you run a business, you understand how those dynamics work. And obviously, you need to spend some time in the private sector before you start pulling out rules. How do you feel about that, Mr. Gauss? You know, does the government have the right to turn your lights off by no, these sir. rules and regulations? <laughs> No, sir, they do not. It seemed to me like there was a lot of nebulism in this. I mean, we talked about mini med plans, and you know, we asked the secretary just to define the number to use in mini med plans, and holy cow, we went off on tens of billions and tens of millions of dollars and gave waivers to fifteen hundred people or industries, you know, picking and choosing. And do you think that was fair? No, I don't. Um, how do you feel about that, Mr. Uprichards? Um, I would agree with Mr. Gauss. I, I don't think it's fair, and we're trying to run a for-profit business. We're trying to make a difference in people's lives, and as we have seen over the last few years, with, even with our current economy, it's not easy. And more regulations, more increased costs that we cannot pass on to our customers will force us out of business. And a business is run on, on somewhat a, a fairly certain environment. You have to have some variances of making sure that you are you're being able to, um, God forbid, make a profit, because that is the only way you can open your doors, keep your doors open um, to do that. Um, do you see the environment that was created by this law making it more certain or less certain? I see it becoming less certain, because the forecasting will be much more difficult. We look at ours right now. But we will have to look at hours in a very different way. Because of the fluctuation in hours of the temporary workers, it will be incredibly difficult to forecast. And people moving in and out of coverage will also be very difficult to forecast. The administrative and compliance piece will, be, will really be problematic for our business. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from Arizona. The chair would now recognize the distinguished gentleman from Maryland, the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Cummings. Chairman, the, um, you know, I've list been listening to all of this, and I was just wondering, Mr. Lippertard? Yes, sir. Yeah, yes. You, Pritchard. Thank you. Um, you realize you're from South Carolina? 
Yes, sir. You realize in 2009, 16 percent of the people in South Carolina had no insurance? Did you know that? No, sir, I did not know that. It is a fact. The, and I am just wondering, you know, I, I ran a small business, a small law firm for years, and we had to do some sacrificing to provide our people with insurance. But we also wanted healthy people. And I know that you are a responsible business person, and I, I, I respect what you are doing. I know business is hard. Um, you know, if you were to testify before folks, uh, you know, like a hearing like this, what would you want? I know you would want people to be insured, would you not? You would want people generally to be insured. Yes, sir. Uh, because if they are not insured, in many instances, uh, as in my district, they die, right? I, I want you to understand that. They are like dead, gone. Um, so I am just wondering, you know, what would you say, I mean, what solution would you have, if any, you don't have to answer this, for trying to help people get insurance? I am not saying this is the answer. I am just do you, have a, do you have an answer on that? Or does it matter? Do we just let them die? No, sir. We, we don't let them die. Okay. But we create a model that is practical and provides flexibility mm -hmm. and has, for example, a 12-month look-back rule. Okay. Mr. Spiro, they have been asking you about the Massachusetts model. I find it so interesting that this, um, obviously, when Governor Romney uh, was uh, the governor, he found, he must have felt that there was a need for some kind of uh, CARE Act. And opponents of the Affordable Care Act ignore the reality that the health reform law could have positive impact on the economy. In addition to reducing the deficit over the next two decades, the ACA could result in significantly improving health outcomes in this country. The number of people without health insurance rose in 2010 and is estimated to be 49.9 million Americans, an increase of 900,000 from 2009. Expanding health uh, coverage uh, definitely improves health outcomes by helping people obtain preventive care. And a, a large part of the Affordable Care Act, of course, is trying to help people stay well so they can have employees. Am, am I right? Because if you are sick, you can't work. That, that's correct, con Congressman. Um, you know, of course it benefits employees uh, and improves their health, but we can't forget how that also benefits employers. And as I said in my testimony, it reduces absenteeism and it increases productivity. And that, uh, that will ripple through the economy. Um, it also deals with the problem of job lock, where people feel like they can't move to uh, another job where they might be more productive. So all those benefits um, uh, are for workers, but also their employers. Now, the ACA also includes a provision in which certain employers, those with at least 50 full-time employees, would pay a penalty for not offering health care coverage or if the insurance they offer does not meet certain criteria and at least one of their workers receives a subsidy from an exchange for individuals. And my colleagues on the other side have argued that this penalty would dramatically lead to sharp reductions in employment. In contrast, the CBO has concluded that such penalties on firms with 50 or more employees that do not offer health insurance would have little effect on hiring. Mr. Spiro, do you believe that such penalties will force employers to dramatically change their hiring practices? And I have heard the testimony of these gentlemen. But the, the, this is the other part. Mr. Spiro, the State of Massachusetts also had an employer responsibility uh, provision in their health plan, which served as the model, the model. I think we need to make sure that is clear. This is Mr. Romney, who is running for President, who now acts like he, didn't, he doesn't like his own plan, uh, he, uh, so, so some people have called, called it Romney care. My understanding is that the employer responsibility provisions of Romney care are much stricter than those in the, in the ACA. Which, with penalties applying to employers with 10 or more full-time employees. Has Massachusetts say, seen a decline or increase in enrollment in employer-based coverage? You are right to point that out, that the Massachusetts employer penalty is much broader in scope. Um, and even so, the vast majority of employers are exempt. Um, and that is the key to remember, is that the employer responsibility under the Affordable Care Act will exempt the vast majority of employers. 
And as you said, the CBO has studied this issue. Um, it will have very marginal effects on the labor market and employment. I think I see my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman uh, from Maryland. Chair, we now recognize the distinguished gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton. Who was the chairman of this committee for six years? That's my ugly face up there on the wall. <laughs> you know, I've been around here for a long, long time, 29 years. How old are you, young man? How old am I? Yeah. 36. 36. You were seven years old when I came to Congress. Uh, let me start off by saying to my colleague, my good buddy down there, that uh, in Indiana, uh, we don't let people die. If people don't have insurance, they still get to go to the emergency room. They do get coverage. And I think it's probably that, play, that way in every part of the, of the country. No question about it, Mr. Spiro, we need to make some changes in health care. You're absolutely right. And we've come up with a bill that we think solves that problem in a little more effective way than, uh, than uh, uh, the Affordable Care, we like to call it Obamacare Act. We believe that small businesses ought to be able to band together to buy insurance like major corporations do so they can get the better rate. We believe that you ought to be able to buy insurance across state lines so that uh, uh, companies out west or in the Midwest can compete with companies in the east. Uh, we believe there ought to be medical savings accounts with tax deductible options in there so that people and the employers put money into an account. If the people don't use that money, say $3,000 a year, it's carried over to the next year and the next year. And then there's a major medical policy above that that takes it up to $100,000 or more. And there's a whole host of things that we have in our bill that does not cause the federal government to start sticking its nose into the private sector. But you're absolutely right. We do make, need to make changes. I'm now the chairman of Europe and Eurasia on the Foreign Affairs Committee. And I just got back from Greece. Greece has had a government that has, from cradle to grave, taken care of people. They've stuck their nose into everything. Do you know what they're doing to salaries today? They're cutting them by 40 percent. Do you know what they're doing to uh, retirement benefits? They're cutting them by 40 percent. They're raising taxes on property, and they're doing it through the utilities over there. And I talked to a policeman who was very supportive of the government until they started doing this and realized that government control over the private sector only leads to chaos. The same thing is happening in Italy. The same thing is happening in Spain. The, things, the same thing is happening in Portugal. Uh, in Ireland, they had a little different situation, but they are in bad, bad trouble as well. And all those things do have an impact on the United States of America. I guess the thing I'd like to get across is uh, the private sector is the thing, the engine that drives this country, that makes this country great, not government, not government regulation or the government sticking its nose into the private sector. What we need to do is get government out of the way so the private sector can flourish and create jobs. The only way that our government can create jobs is to take taxpayers' money. You mentioned the, two, the, the term redistribution of wealth. The only way the government can do that is to take money away from the guy that's the entrepreneur that's creating jobs and then give it to somebody else from the government. And it just creates a big mess. Right now, I don't know how many regulations we've had added to the mix in the last couple of years, but I think it's about five or six hundred or more. And that's another albatross around the neck of the private sector. And it's just really, really sad. When I hear a businessman like Mr. Goss and Mr. How do you pronounce it? Uh, Uperchard. Uperchard. I didn't hear you, Mr. Lentz. I apologize. I was late getting here. When I hear them tell us that they're going to lay people off because of a government intrusion into their business, whether it's health care or anything else, it really, really bothers me. I had my own business. You know, I started it by myself. And, and I know what it means to have government sticking their nose into your business. Now, you're absolutely right. We need to do everything we can to make it more affordable for people. And the way to do that is, as I said, to get government out of the way, to create incentives for business and industry to, to provide insurance, to give tax incentives for people to do that, but not to have the government come in and say, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this, because it only leads to a real, really big problem. And, and I, I, I hope that you and, and other young people like you who are interested in doing good for the country, 
I hope you will take a little look at, at history and look at what is going on in other countries around the world where the government has been very intrusive, because it doesn't work. It didn't work in Russia. It doesn't work in Greece. It will not work in Spain. It hasn't worked in Italy. And it isn't going to work here. What will happen is government will cause the free enterprise system to collapse. We need to be a help to the private sector by creating incentives for them to do the things that need to be done. And that is why the approach that we have taken, let me just finish, Mr. Chairman, I will get out of the way here. The, the, the approach that we think needs to be taken is to create incentives for the private sector to do the right thing without government intrusion. And so um, I won't ask any questions. I just thought I would get that off my chest, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank the gentleman Mr. Chairman, from Indiana. Can I, respond to, can I respond, Mr. Chairman? Oh, I would well, love to hear what he has to say. Well, let, let, let me do this, because they have called for votes, and only because the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay, is such an efficient questioner uh, and is uh, pithy with both his questions and those that you will be with your answers, we will try to get the gentleman from Missouri in so we don't have to go vote and waste an hour of your time. Uh, with that, the uh, distinguished gentleman from Missouri. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I will be efficient and uh, keep it brief. Some have argued that employers face considerable confusion and uncertainty about the ACA, including what it will cost employers in 2014, thus making planning for the future difficult. However, the Federal Government website uh, www.healthcare.gov was launched after the ACA was enacted. Uh, managed by the Department of Health and Human Services, this website provides uh, comprehensive information about provisions of the ACA, including a small business site with up-to-date guidance, guidance on small business tax credits, coverage options, and reinsurance for retirees, among other things. Uh, Mr. Spiro, do you believe that there is a lack of information available for small businesses explaining the provisions of the ACA? Congressman, there is a wealth of resources. As you mentioned, healthcare.gov, there are calculators so that small businesses can figure out if they are eligible for a tax credit. Um, in addition, on this very issue with respect to temporary workers, you can see that the Treasury Department is being very responsive. They sent out a notice for a request for comment um, before even issuing a proposed rule. Um, they are gathering those comments, and they are going to then issue a proposed rule, then get more comments before issuing a final rule. So it has been a very transparent process, and they have gone out of their way to solicit feedback from stakeholders, such as the other witnesses at the table. Could the uh, Federal Government do a better job of making sure that the necessary information is available for employers uh, as they seek to comply with the ACA's requirements? I think that there is lots of information out there, and I think hearings like this are an important piece of that to um, make the public aware of issues and uh, surrounding implementation. So obviously always more can be done, but I am very pleased with the way the administration has been transparent and uh, seeking comments um, and being responsive. Yeah, and on that point for the entire panel, the IRS, HHS and Treasury have all conducted outreach to stakeholders uh, to provide comment and guidance on a broad range of employment uh, definitions. Did any of you provide comment to the agencies or departments promulgating these guidelines uh, to express your concerns? And Mr. Lentz. Yes, sir, we have. We have been working very closely with the administration, in fact. I mean, we, and we do appreciate the efforts that are being made. Uh, but it is a complex subject, and we are concerned that they may not get it right or they may not have the legal authority to do what they need to do to fix the concerns that we have. Thank you. Mr. Up, Richard, have you? Yes, yes, sir, Mr. Clay, we have. As a matter of fact, um, I have been working closely with the Deputy of Health and Human Services for the Southeast, Anton Gunn, and he is actually coming to Greenville to speak to some of our customer base on November 15th. And when I was coming here to D.C., he did try to make some introductions for me to the folks at the Treasury Department and Internal Revenue Service, but they were unresponsive with the request for a meeting. Thank you. 
Uh, yes, sir. I did, uh, mostly through Mr. Lenz, because I have been fighting on the State level because of my unemployment taxes going through the ceiling. If I could answer your, the, about the website information, it is thorough enough for me. That is where I got the $711,000 that is going to put me out of business. That is how I understood it. And I am in the trenches. I am on the ground, boots on the ground. Thank you for that response. Mr. Spiro, would you uh, care, to, care to respond to Mr. Oh, Burden's comment? Sure. Do we have time, Mr. Chairman? Uh, I can be gotta, brief. You, you, you have to solve all the world's problems in 37 seconds. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I would just respond that the Affordable Care Act is fundamentally a market-based solution. It is not single-payer health care, as you would find in Europe. Um, and I think that is why Mitt Romney supported it in Massachusetts. Um, I would say, you know, when you raise the issue of Greece and the debt problems in Europe, that is exactly why the Affordable Care Act was necessary. CBO found that it reduced the deficit $143 billion over the first 10 years and continues to reduce the deficit in subsequent decades. I think that repealing the Affordable Care Act would have the opposite effect and would worsen our debt problems. Uh, on behalf of all of us, we want to thank our uh, witnesses for your expertise, for your collegiality towards one another, for your um, uh, helpfulness uh, to this committee on what is a very important uh, issue. So thank all four of you. Um, and I am not singling anyone out, but uh, Mr. U. Pritchard, uh, safe passage back to uh, Heaven's Gateway in the upstate of South Carolina. Uh, with that, the committee is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.